right. Our next talk is Cyber Resilience and Recovery by Jason B. Beatty. Beatty, I'm sorry. Jason Beatty. Uh, I'm an IT executive with 23 years experience in management, security administration, auditing, network administration, and corporate training. Extensive experience building policies, procedures, and mechanisms for use of HIPAA, SOX, and PCI compliance. Please welcome Jason B. So yes, this, this is geared very much toward managers, directors, leaders. So just, there's not a whole lot of technical stuff in this. A lot of policies and procedures, it's very much a blue talk. So just FYI. Uh, like I said, my name is Jason Beatty. I'm the Vice President of Information Technology and the Chief Security Officer for a healthcare company here in Nashville. Um, I've been in the business for, since the 90s. <coughs> doing a lot with policies, procedures, mechanisms, making sure that we stay compliant. So, one thing I wanted to talk about is I want to talk about a little history of that. So, if you think back in history, and, and this is all going to come to a point here in a minute, so just bear with me, but you guys remember ARPANET, right? In the 70s, Washington, Hilton, we go to SmooCon every year to celebrate the, the invention of the internet. That's where it was invented at, at the Washington Hilton. Uh, these guys that got together, no, Al Gore was not there. These guys got together and decided to make the ARPANET. One of the first things that happened in the ARPANET when it started was what was called the Creeper. You guys remember that? Creeper? Contract people through ARPANET. So, what happened? We developed something to fix that. It's called the Reaper. We were going to find out what had been changed that the Creeper had done. Very first cybersecurity cat and mouse game, if you will. Uh, we fast forward 10 years, a guy by the name of John McAfee developed antivirus, basically. Started that, we started doing that, um, keeping our computers secure, keeping our network secure. Uh, 90s, we move online, everything goes to the web. 2000s, cyber attacks become very professional. 2010s, governments take over. Um, if you were in cybersecurity around this time, uh, there was one really big thing that changed the world. You guys remember what that was? In cybersecurity, the one thing that changed the landscape of everything. Cell phones. I'm talking about a specific attack. Stokes name is one. The target breach, right? Why did that change? Well, let me tell you what. Before the target breach happened, most companies put 9% of their IT budget into cybersecurity. After Target, the day after the CEO went to prison and they lost billions of dollars, that went from 9% to 29% the next day. So all of a sudden, everybody's going, ah, I've got all this money to blow on cybersecurity. Well, I need resources. I need bodies. Well, guess what? There wasn't any bodies. Everybody who had a job, had needed. everybody who needed a job had a job. So you start seeing the spot where Cybersecurity is asking for more than we're able to get there. Everybody who was in cybersecurity at that time, I was working for a private laboratory, and all of a sudden my phone started ringing off the hook. How much money do you want to make? Where do you want to live? You want to come to DC? You want to come to LA? We're ready for you. We'll pay you what you want. I landed on a Fortune 15 company, um, kept my family here in Nashville because I like Nashville, and I worked for that company for a while. Uh, that was big. That changed everything. So all of a sudden, the next year, we went to Black Hat. There were 1,900 new cybersecurity vendors at Black Hat <coughs> than there were before. I know a lot of you guys have been Black Hat. Raise your hand. Anybody been to Black Hat? Right? Walk out on the floor. What happens? Dude, they're everywhere. Come see me. You know? How many of you guys, if you're in a manager or director position, you have a LinkedIn account, your phone rings off the hook. Your email rings off the hook. How many people are like, I want to be your friend? Okay, now that I'm your friend, give me 10 minutes. Give me 15 minutes of your time. Anybody ever get that question asked? I get about 50 of those a day. Wow. Give me 15 minutes of your time. Well, I don't have that much time. So, once again, I'm explaining what's going on in the world. Uh, 2010s, we start seeing government attacks, right? A uh, buddy of mine, uh, some of you guys probably know him, Mike Murphy, I know you know him. Mike Murphy, good friend of mine, working at the Pentagon. All of a sudden, North Korea decides they're going to attack Sony. They're going to attack Sony because Sony wants to release a movie. And that movie makes 
light, a little bit light of, of North Korea. So what does North Korea do? Let me tell you what, North Korea is no joke. They got over a thousand hackers that are state-of-the-art guys who know exactly what they're doing. So they just decided they were going to take Sony down. And they did. So what did Sony do? They started calling all of us. Uh, they finally get in touch with Mike. Mike goes out there. He runs their Eastern Asian division now, lives in Vietnam. Thailand half the time. But anyway, um, once again, we're fixing a problem, right? How are we fixing the problem? We're throwing money at it. Throwing money at people, throwing money at resources. I want to secure a place. Well, great. Let's go to Black Hat. Let's pick out 15 to 20 different applications and let's stand them up and whew, we're secure now, right? Um, and now we go to the 2020s and we're starting to see ransomware and extortion. I meet with the FBI once a quarter. The last time I met with them, we're on task to lose $9 billion this year as a nation on nothing but ransomware and extortion. You see what I'm saying? It's like Indiana Jones. There's a big boulder behind us. It's rolling after us. We're running downhill. Right? What if? Oh, sorry. This ain't the wrong way. There we go. So what have we done? What have we done to combat? I just took you through the history of when cybersecurity first started to where we're at now. What have we done to combat that? Well, you know, we, we started hardening the infrastructure, right? Firewalls, GUI centers, hard infrastructures. Nobody can get in. Right? Started that. Well, that didn't work because now everybody's got a cell phone in their pocket, right? That cell phone's connected to the network. We don't have any, you're inside of the castle, you're outside of the castle. That's gone. Right? So that didn't work anymore. Compliance and auditing. Yep. 96, the government got tired of the laboratories doing fraud and abuse and stealing all of their money. So what did they do? They came in and they started what was called HIPAA, right? You guys know HIPAA? Started in 96. What did they do? They went after the seven top laboratories in the United States of America. All seven of those laboratories folded. Now, four of them came together to get what we have as Quest today. The other three are LabCorp, but they all seven folded at that time because they were all doing fraud and abuse. The fraud part, they walk in, they get a complete blood workup, that's 11 tests, they ICD code that each individually because they get paid more per test than they do for the one ICD code, that's fraud. They're doing it, they're making extra money. Abuse, that's a little different. Now they do make extra money on that, that's because they've done a test and then they've done a complete blood work and then they turn around and they don't refund that first test back, which is part of the second one. So that's abuse. Either way, some of them went to jail, all of them fold. Compliance. Um, you remember um, Enron. Enron came out, right? Took all these people's money. Next thing you know, you got Sabine Oxley stepping in. Uh, everybody starts losing credit card money. Next thing you know, the PCI jumps up. Payment kind of industry jumps in. Now we've got all this compliance. And they're basically standing there and they're telling you, in order for you to be secure, you need to do step one through 288. Right? How many people work with PCI? Raise your hand. You know what I'm talking about, right? PCI DSSD. 288 questions and they are not, you need, you need recommended. This is, you know, HIPAA is a little different. HIPAA is, this is required, this is recommended in order to keep you secure. We'll work with you. PCI, no. Do you do this, yes or no? If you say no, you do not take credit cards. Period. Because they had more money to lose, right? So PCI is going to be a lot stricter. Um, red teams and blue teams and all the other colors of teams that we've come up with, right? Uh, security awareness. How many people have seen the memes? Do everything in the world. One user opens up an email, says, yes, I would like a $100 Amazon gift card and everything is wiped out, <laughs> right? These are the problems we're facing, right? And how are we fixing those? We're not. Throwing we're, money at it. We're throwing money at it. We're throwing money at products. We're throwing money at people. We're putting other bodies. We are not coming to a solution. And the reason why that is, is because we have not changed. We're doing things the same way we were doing 20 years ago for different problems, right? Now, change. Oh, that's a good one. <coughs> Security leaders need to change. Um, change before you have to. I've got some quotes of my favorites up here, right? Uh, you've ever heard that? Jack Welch, change before you have to. The most dangerous phrase in language is, we've always done it this way. Grace Hopper. Grace Hopper. Change is inevitable. Growth is optional. John Maxwell, right? 
Life does not get her by chance, get better by chance, it gets better by change. Look at the companies that started a hundred years ago. The companies that no longer exist, they didn't change. Right? The companies that still exist today, they changed. Sears and Roebuck. Great example. Sears and Roebuck, right? Service merchandise. We could name hundreds of them, right? We could talk about this. As cybersecurity professionals, we can see this in the business. I see this every day in the business. But we don't do it in cybersecurity. We are not changing the way we are supposed to be changing in cybersecurity to combat the problem that we know is out there, that beats us every day, right? We're hearing the same talks, right? I, I, you hear the same talks you did 10 years ago. You hear the same things on compliance. You hear the same things when you're audited. You hear the same things when somebody comes in and does an external pen test. I've read those. I've been brought into companies before where they throw the pen test in front of me and say, what do we do? How do we fix these? Well, you know, you gotta have these policies in place, you gotta have this in place, but more importantly, we've gotta change in order to face that. We have to be, as IT professionals, we have to be good leaders. We can't just manage the problems anymore because we're not fixing the problems. The problems are changing, they're getting worse, and we're just managing what we can. Uh, a lot of people think they're good leaders, but in reality, they're just good managers. They're managing their teams well day to day, but they're not really going anywhere. Uh, how many people have been working for the same company over five years? Okay. Do you think your cybersecurity program is better today than it was five years ago? Probably. Probably is, right? Do you think it's well equipped to fight everything that's coming at you? Why is that? Money resources, right? That's what we always say. That's where we always go. Well, you know, I can't do anything. I don't have the resources. Can't fix my biggest vulnerability. Can't fix your biggest vulnerability. People are our biggest vulnerability, right? People are our biggest vulnerability. Um, people don't want a job with a manager. They want a job with a leader. People want to go on a journey. You know, when you hire people, I'll tell you this right now. The worst problem that I have is keeping people. When I hire people and I train them in my philosophy and I lead them into security, they leave me for $100,000 more a year. And that's happened to me three times this year. Because I'm trying to train people to tackle security concerns the way they're supposed to and people see that and they're like, hey, hey I'll take that person. Happens all the time. But basically what I do is I start with a destination. This is, this is what I do. And I choose cyber resilience because it's on the board because, and I'll show you why in a minute because that's one of the hot topic words to say, right? Gets everybody in the middle. Mission critical applications. My company has mission critical applications. I have four of them. Your company has mission cr critical applications. Do you know what they are? What does it take for your company to continue to make money tomorrow? All right, here's the scenario. You get up in the morning, you walk into work, you turn on a computer and nothing's there. Ransomware is taking everything. Everything complete. Everything's gone. Don't just think it could happen to me. You have to plan on it happening to you. It's going to happen, right? That's, that's the solution we're at now, right? I walk in, there's nothing. What do I need to get up and running? What order do I need to get up and running? I told you I had four applications. They're in four specific orders. I have this one first, this one, this one, this one. It may take three services and accounts to run this one, two to run this one, five to run this one, so forth and so on. I have to know them. And I also have to know I can walk into my CEO's office and say, we're completely down. I can have one, my first one up and going in two hours. The second one's going to take me four after that, and the third one's going to take me three after that. I'm ready to go. I have my recovery built. So now I'm prepared for what I know is going to happen because they're going to continue to attack until they get in, right? They're going to continue to attack until they get what they want, get you shut down, ransomware you, however they do. How do you get back to where you're at right now before the attack and how fast can you do it? And that is where we need to be putting our time. Not in trying to prevent it. We need to be resilient. We need to do everything we need to do. But we also need to say, you know what? Also, after it happens, how do I get back? Executive approval. Big. I speak with my CEO every day. 
He calls me on the phone. I walk into the business owners of my company all the time. Person who runs this department, this department is crucial for us to do business. I walk into her office and I say, what do you need to do your job? Tell me what you need to do. Do you need phones? Do you need Salesforce? Do you need this application? What order you need them and how, how much can you go down? And if you go down and you don't have those three applications, what are you going to do? How are you going to do it until I get you those? I can get you those three applications back in two hours. What are you going to do in those two hours? I'm asking those questions to my business leaders and I'm expecting answers back. And I'm asking, I'm telling my CEO, this is what I'm asked and this is what I'm waiting for in order for us to stay relevant. Because once again, we don't want to be service merchandise. I don't want to be the guy who is no longer relevant because my company is no longer there. I want to be the guy who says, yep, we're down, we're back up again, here are the stop gaps we put in place to do until we get back up, and this is when we're going to be back up. So, business continuity plan. That's basically what we're talking about, right? What do I need in my business continuity plan? Well, I need my resilience. I need a really good security incident awareness plan. What happens when stuff happens? Who do I call? Who do I call? What's that person's phone number? All the way from the first person who walks in and lays it on my desk, we have a problem, till I'm picking up the phone and I'm calling the FBI and I'm like, look, we've got a problem. Everything that happens from point A to point B, from top to bottom, I have that written in a plan. I have a pretty little flow chart that I write up and I tape on everybody's wall so everybody knows what's happening if we have a security attack, okay? Disaster recovery plan. Uh, what do we do when something goes down? Do we have a good disaster? How many has a really good disaster recovery plan? Raise your hand. How many test it often? Does it work? Well, in theory it should work, right? In theory it should work, but have you ever tested that? Walk in, pop, pull the firewall, see what happens. See what breaks. See how long it takes your team to fix that break. And is that suitable for your business? Root cause analysis and improvement plan. I'll get into that a little bit more later um, in this talk, but I always had that as part of my business continuity plan, and I'll explain to you why in a minute. Uh, security awareness program. Everybody who works at my company, very first day they walk in the door to start at my company, it's always on a Monday, it's always on every other Monday. They sit down wherever they're at across the nation in front of a computer, and guess what happens? I happen. I show up for 30 minutes and I go, hello, welcome to the company. This is what's expected of you. This is what's expected of you from HIPAA. This is what's expected of you from PCI. And this is what's expected of you from security. I expect you to do this if you're going to work for this company. Here is my email address. If you see something, you let me know. I need to know. Do you know yesterday I was sitting right back, I think, in that chair right there. Got seven emails like this, bam, 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 bam. First email was from somebody in Texas. Hey man, is this legit? Second email was from somebody in Massachusetts. Hey, is this legit? Seven emails asking if this was legit. Sent it to one of my people, my people checked it and said, yep, yep, that was supposed to be sent out to you, that is a legit email, you're good to that. Seven people emailed me in the span of two minutes to ask me if this email was legit. Can you say that about your company? Yes, but unfortunately I tend to go all the way through the ground. Okay. Um, security awareness program. Have a good one. How many times do you do phishing attacks? I do a phishing attack every quarter. You get three shots. If you fail a phishing attack three times in a year, sorry, you're out the door. CEO approval. Payment card industry does that, right? Why can't we? We're in healthcare. This is important stuff, right? Do you want your healthcare information in the hands of somebody else? No, I don't want it either. And I do my best to make sure that never happens to anybody who is a patient of my company. So, business continuity plan. You should have a digital and a physical. This is my office. Yes, I know, that is a nice couch. <laughs> I bought that myself, put that on. It sits so good and sleeps well as well. You see this book right here? That's my business continuity plan. That's a physical copy of it laying on the desk in my office. I have a digital copy online as well, but what's gonna happen if you completely get shut down and you can't get to anything? Well, you're gonna go in there and grab the physical copy. 
Security incident response plan. I told you I had a flow chart. Anytime anything is reported to anybody who works for me, I have a flow chart that takes me through everything. Um, this flow chart has been in a lot of places. There is a lot of my friends that have like, hey, you write a really good security incident response plan. I would like to use that. I send them this flow chart. Here you go. This flow chart's probably being used by 50 companies in the national area right now. Super simple. You have a decision to make. Is it a risk? Is it not a risk? Um, do I need to bring this as InfoSec? This is when it lands on my desk. That's me and that's the person bringing it to me, right? I have to decide if I need to put in an incident response program into place. And if I do, it's a team of people, right? This, from here to here, is a security incident. It is it's not a breach. We do not say the word breach, right? That's a security incident. The only people who can decide if this is a breach is this team right here. Nobody in my company ever sends me an email and says, hey, I think we've got a breach. No, 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 no. We have a security incident until this team decides. Because when you say breach, that brings in a lot more problems, right? So, security incident, great. Security incidents are perfect. I love them. We learn from our mistakes. Every time I do have a security incident, I write it up as a security incident, I set up a root cause analysis from it, and I figure out what the gap is. Okay, somebody may be faxing something to the wrong fax number. Oops, I've messed that up. I actually typed in the wrong number. How can I force them to type in the right number? Is there a way that I can automate that for them where it pulls the number, I script it to pull it out of the EMR and put it into the fax number? If I can do that, I can eliminate that human error. Companies that have a lot of security incidents don't have many breaches. The companies who have no security incidents have breaches, right? It's like driving a boat across the ocean. You all of a sudden you see a leak, you patch it, you don't sink. Another one pops up, you patch it, you don't sink. You may be patching all day long until you get all your holes fixed, but you're not sinking. Great quote, right? Mike Tyson, everybody loves this quote. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And let me tell you what, if anybody, some of you guys are young, but I can remember watching Mike Tyson fight, and let me tell you what, when he punches you in the mouth, everything goes out the window. That guy can punch, man. Am I right? <laughs> He was a beast. Um, root cause analysis and improvement plan. Yes, you should have one for every security incident. And here's the issue. Here's the issue with security incidents. Here's the issue with, hey, I need a SIM system. I'm going to go buy QRadar and put it into my organization. People do that and they're like, great, done. And they walk away. And that program is only as good as the day you stop tuning it. All of these applications that you spend all this money on to make you compliant. If you don't ever look at them, that would be any good. The Target breach, right? or no, the Home Depot breach. Remember the Home Depot breach? That Home Depot breach sat on their SIM system for 284 days before somebody said, what is this running around our network? Oh, wow. Why? Well, I can tell you why. Because I talked to them after their breach to explain to them what they did wrong. Their EPS coming in, events per second, if you know anything about a SIM system, was over 10,000 events per second. They had two guys trying to alleviate that. So you got two guys looking at 10,000 events every second and picking out the bad ones and saying, this is a bad one, we need to fix it. See the problem? You understand why they had their breach, right? Still use your credit card at Home Depot? I don't. Not until they fix that. Fix your problems. Fix your security ends. Take each one of them like they're a little mini breach that you yourself are the only one that knows about and you have the ability to fix it so it never happens again. Now that is where you put your resources when you hire new people. Because that makes you better, right? That actually makes your company better, makes your security better. Uh, external audits. We all hate them. We don't need to. We need to love them, right? They're going to show me what I don't know. It gets to the point, if you do this often enough, your external auditor will sit down at the end of their audit and they'll say A, B, and C is wrong. And you pull out a piece of paper where A, B, and C is written down on that piece of paper and say, 
That's my budget to fix next year right there. You guys should be on the same page. If they tell you something that you don't know, don't get defensive about it. Fix it. Always have other people who are smarter than you look at your framework. Right? Or people who do this forever. So many companies I've walked into and they'll be like LBMC or FHA was just here and they just did an external audit and here's what they found. Let me see what that looks like. Did you know this was a problem? Did you know that this was not done correctly? Take those seriously and fix those issues because at the end of the day, once again, we're just trying to get better, right? Um, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, you know? If there's anything around here more important than my ego, I want it caught and shot now. I love that. I love that quote. Uh, speaking of that, um, I have an office in Brentwood, right? I could sit in that office with all the corporate people, right? Go out to the nice lunches, attend to the nice events like Freak Nick, right? And never go to my centers. I can sit there and I can write a really good security awareness plan, really good policies and procedures. What happens in your hospital in Texas if you write a policy and procedure that they must follow to be secure, but if they follow it, they can't do their job? What are they going to do? Not follow it. They're going to go around it. I can't use a VPN to do this. This is not time efficient for me. I'm just going to walk around that and do it this way. It works without the VPN. Yeah, why not? I go to every one of my centers every single year. I sit down with the nurses and with the BHTs and I say, show me what you're doing. Show me this. How does this affect you? I know what they do. And you know how much I found? Ooh, we need to fix that. Oh, you're taking that, you're writing that credit card number now in there and not putting it in here in the system. What's well, easier to keep it so I don't have to look it up? Well, we need to fix that. <laughs> You can't do everything right, or you can do everything right and still get a breach. Everybody in the company should know that you're the security person. Everybody knows me. They know I'm the security person. I tell everybody, you know, I'll make you a paper hat. I'll write security on it. You can have it. You can wear it on your head as you walk around the company because you're on the security team with me. Everybody works for me in security in my company because if you don't have them in there, you get that situation where you have your 10 people. The 10 people that I am worried the most about as security risk in my company are the first 10 people that will call me on cell phone or email me and say, is this legit? Because I have sat down face to face with them and explained to them, this is a security problem. Here's how you fix it. If you don't know, I don't care. I tell them all the time. I don't care if you think there's a squirrel outside your window looking at you through a pair of binoculars and you think you're crazy because of that. I still want to know about it. Probably not a squirrel out there, but I'm going to investigate it just in case. I'm taking you seriously because it's important to me. You're a crappy security person, but you're the best nurse or you're the best therapist I got. And that's your job. You be a nurse, you be a therapist. If you have a security problem, you come to me. You have to get their buy-in because when you get their buy-in, they're going to come to you with any security problem. I work on that with everybody who starts at my company on day one in my 30 minutes. And then I reinforce that by visiting them every year. Yeah, I'm in the air about 30, 40 times a year. I'm traveling a lot. But it's important. It's important to put yourself in that, pit, in that person's face. So that brings me to what we have, were talking about earlier. We have all this compliance that we have to face. So one of the most important jobs as a security leader in your company is to convince the board and convince the C-levels that compliance is not secure. You have to convince them. Otherwise, what's going to happen is when you go back to them and you ask for more money and they're going to be like, we just passed our compliance audit with flying colors. Sure we did. But do you would you like to go to jail or not? Answer me that question. I have asked my CEOs that point blank. Do you want to go in jail? How do you feel like you will fare in jail? My entire job is to keep this company running and to keep you out of prison. That's what I'm trying to do. This is why I'm doing it. Now, most of the time you're going to get buy-in. Sometimes you don't. But you fight until you do. Because if you don't have the buy-in of your board, 
then you don't have buy. I'm lucky enough, oh, sorry, I'm lucky enough to, my board owns a bunch of companies, one of them was breached. One of those companies was breached that my board owns in a different state. So they come to me and they're like, dude, what, do, what else do we need to do? How much money do you need to be secure? What do you need us to do? Because they know the pain. If your company doesn't know the pain yet, show them a company that felt it. Um, so yeah, compliance versus security. Why am I asking for, mo for, for more money when I thought we were compliant? I used to tell people when I taught classes all the time, compliance is like a 100 yard dash. When you get to about the 30 or 40 yard line, you are compliant, but you haven't won the race. And why is that? Simple. Compliance is set up to help you, not fix you. Compliance is there to give you a baseline on how to build your security systems. The people who work for the government, who are in government contracts, you know, and we know a lot of those people that are good friends of ours. They have compliance that is way above anything that we have to do. And they still go beyond that because they are being attacked daily by the many. Good question to ask yourself is how many attacks do you get a day? Does anybody know? Do anybody know how many attacks you get a day? I get around 15 <coughs> to 20,000 attacks on my email server or my egress points every seven days. Know that for a fact. If you don't know how many attacks you're getting, that's a problem. Are you watching your egress points? Are you watching your email server? Do you understand? What these people, how these people are attacking you? You can't fix something you don't know about, right? Go back to Home Depot, 284 days sitting there, nobody even knew. Policies and procedures. This is my great, uh, I actually had a, saw a video on this one time with the cat and a piece of toast, you know. <laughs> Butter always falls, you know, and you can create a, a wormhole if you tape a piece of toast to a cat, right? Um, yeah, and it tells you how to do it. There's the math and everything. It's sound. You can go home and do this yourself, right? Create wormholes all over Nashville, right? Don't make things too complicated. Because if you make it complicated, they're not going to follow it. They are not going to do something if you make it harder than their job. Try to keep it simple. But you all need to be OCD. How many people are OCD? I'm OCD. I have a big hand up right here. Yes, right. You need to be OCD. You need to separate your colors and M&Ms, right? That is important. When you have a problem, does it not drive you crazy until you fix it? You know what I'm saying? Same thing with policies and procedures. When you write your policies and procedures, those policies and procedures need to be easy to understand. They need to be in a public place where everybody can see them. You need to tell them, there's your 33 policies. And I have 33. I have 33 policies and procedures to run my company. Security policies and procedures. There they are, right there. Go read them. They tell you exactly what you should be doing. They're simple. They're easy to understand. And they find risk. Now, some of them are policies and procedures you have to have, right? For, as part of HIPAA, one of the administrative safeguards of HIPAA is you must have a privacy and a security officer in your company. They have to be named. There has to be a policy and procedure that sits there that says these people are, or your, is your privacy officer, this person's your security officer, here's how you get in touch with them. Part, it's, rec it's, it's required to have for HIPAA, everybody has it, right? That's a simple one. That doesn't really attack anything we're trying to fix, but it has to be there. So you have your policies and procedures that are just black and white. But I also have one that's an acceptable use policy. And I can take leniency with that. I have one that's a cell phone use policy. Or I'm telling you what you can and what you can't do on a cell phone. What you can and what you can't do with my PHI. When you access my network, how do you do it? What you need, right? Now, how many people think that everybody in their company will adhere to those on day one? Raise your hand. <laughs> Don't see a lot of hands up. Maybe on day one, not day two. So, next step, here's what I did. I've got compliance paperwork. Hey, so there's the policies and procedures. I've given you the ability to see them. I need you to sign this, telling me you've read those. How many people now are gonna follow them? Maybe a few more, but they know they're gonna have their behind to a wall if they don't. You could lose your job 
if you do not follow. Some of my policies and procedures have that beautiful sentence that I love so much. It's my second favorite sentence in policies and procedures. My first one is in job description, and that's that last line that I put on all my job descriptions that says all other assigned duties by the <laughs> VP, which basically means that if I need you to wash my car, you've signed a job description saying you will. Not that I have you do that, but my second favorite one is up to and including termination. You will do this, or I will punish you up to or including termination. Now, does that mean we're out to terminate everybody? No. That just means I want you to know how serious it is that I've spent the time to write these and I, how serious it is that I think you need to sign them so that we're on the same page. These are just, I listed mine. These are the ones I have everybody in my company sign. If you're getting VPN access, you're going to sign something that says you're going to keep your computer at home at least up to this type of security. You're going to have some sort of antivirus or characteristic analysis on it. You're going to have some sort of, a, you're going to let me put my Caspi solution on it if needed. To secure this before, I'm going to let you come to my VPN. I want to make sure that you're not owned on your home computer before you connect that to my network. Simple enough, right? Confidentiality agreements, you see things, you have to sign on security card. If you get a security card to get in out of my business, you're signing a piece of paper. Um, if you bring your own device, you're signing a piece of paper, and in order to access email, you're signing a piece of paper. If you're going to see anything that has to do with PHI, because like I said, I'm in healthcare. This may be different from people who are not in healthcare, but if it's proprietary information, they need to sign something saying that they will protect that. Right? We do it everywhere else. How I many you guys got kids? Right? You take kids somewhere, you drop them off, you're signing something, right? You send them to school, you're signing something. You're saying that this, you will adhere to these rules. It's a contract. So, I put this out before. This is why I picked cyber resilience. These, uh, NVIDIA Security did a poll of black hat attendees last year. Which of these most overused buzzwords in cybersecurity today? Number one was zero trust. I didn't think I should name it zero trust. I chose uh, cyber resilience. But these are the buzzwords, right? These are how the salespeople get to you, right? How's your zero trust look? Maybe you need my product to fix it. So, just to summarize real quickly, I do feel like that there is something to be gained by looking at security in a different light. Because what we're doing isn't working. I feel like that we as security professionals need to change that. And the way that we're going to change that is we are going to prepare our companies on how to be secure the best we can, good security incident plans, good security incident follow-ups, good root cause analysis, good policies and procedures, good security awareness program. We're doing everything that we can to make sure that we do not get breached. But what we don't do is we don't do what comes after that. You need a good business continuity plan. You need to understand what happens tomorrow when you walk in and you're completely dead in the water. How? What do you do next? Know that. Walk in, sit down, go, oh, I'm dead in the water. I've got to get these four applications up and going. Here's what I'm doing first. Boom, boom, boom. Hey, my team. I get on the phone. I call my team up. Here we go. You do this, you do this, you do this. Get this running, get this running. Get back up and recover. Recover quickly is the best thing you can do after a breach. How many of you guys have ever experienced a breach? Been there? Okay, so man, how was the recovery? Terrifying. Stressful. Yes. What if you had a plan? What if you knew that was going to happen and you had a plan that said, this is exactly what I'm going to do to fix that? Lower stress level. Lower your stress level. Get your company up and going to where it can be successful again because you're never, ever going to stop these people from breaking into your company. It's going to happen. It's happened to some of the best secure companies in the world. And it's only going to get worse. So if you don't take anything away from this talk, take that away from this talk. Be prepared to recover from that. Uh, that's my email address, my personal email address. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, if you have any questions now. Yes, sir. Hey, Jay, thank you very much. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you find the balance between 
feeling good about security and uh, ease of production for your for your employees. I so I, I'm that I'm that guy. I do not sit in my ivory tower. Everybody who works for me wants to work for me. Those three guys who left, they are grown men, and they walked in my office, all three of them, with tears in their eyes, hating to leave. I had one guy walk in, and he's like, "I hate this. This is the worst thing in my world." But here's the deal: I can go to this other company. My girlfriend can quit working and go back to college. We can buy a house and get married and start having kids. And you know what I did? I took that guy out to dinner and I said, good job. You have made your dreams come true. I brought that guy through three companies. He worked for me for three different companies and followed me. He was loyal. He was smart. I took him off a help desk and turned him into a security engineer who could do a really good security engineer job. And he's doing a great job today. I try to lead my team. I meet with my team. Um, once I meet with everybody, I have 12 people that work for me across the nation. I meet with them for one hour every week. My leadership team, the guys who lead the team, I meet with them for another hour every week to find out what I can do to make their life easier. When I tell, so I've moved two data centers in the company that I'm in. Both of them were moved on Labor Days. Great, great. Labor Day is a great time to move a data center if y'all is there want to do it. Go into your CEO's office, tell them they're going to be down for three days, go move a data center. Um, I walked into my CEO's office and I said, I've taken four guys and I made them work Labor Day weekend for me. And we've moved this data center and they've done a great job. I want you to give them a cash payout right now. On top of what they make, give them a bonus. Write them a check. I make sure that my guys are taken care of. I make sure my employees are taken care of. My door is always open. I am constantly going around. Like I said, I'm a, the security officer for the company too. So every year I go into every one of my hospitals, uh, usually around March, and I walk through that hospital and I look at everything. And I walk into a nurse's office and I'll be like, we need to change the way this nurse's office is. And let me tell you why. You walk through that door and you sit in that chair and the nurse is back here and the nurse can't get out and that door shuts and that's not safe for that nurse. This patient could, you know, be an acute patient. They could have some mental problems. I don't want you, that patient between you and the door. So I change the office. I'll physically go in, I'll go to my operations officer and I'll make them change that office where she has a way out, where she's not trapped, or that door stays open, or something like that. So to answer your question, as I'm being around the bush, I try to take care of my employees. From a physically safe standpoint, I, I teach them every day that my job is to keep them out of jail as well, to keep them from paying HIPAA fines as well. I am here to take care of you. Let me take care of you. And then I reiterate that every time I go. And I talk to everybody. When I go into a hospital, I talk to everybody from the receptionist to the janitor to the lady who's doing the laundry downstairs. What can we do to make your life easier? What have you seen that I need to know about? What's the problems that you have? I write every one of those down and I go back to my board and I say, these are the things we need to fix. If you give, you, if you give that much of yourself to the employees, these people will bend over backwards for you. They just want to do a good job. They just want to make a paycheck. And they just want to do the right thing. So I deal with behavioral health and addiction treatment. It's, it's my biggest company right now that I work with. Everybody who comes into my office, I tell them one thing. I say, look, behavioral health is not easy. These people who come to us and stay 30 days, 60 days, 90 days in a detox situation, in an IOP situation, they are changing their life for the better. The worst thing we can do to them is for them to get home and find out their identity's been stolen and their bank account's been drained. After they put so much of their self into trying to get better, we're giving these people a second chance at life. We're giving parents their kids back, and kids their parents back. We do not want to do anything that's going to cause these people to revert back to their old lifestyle because we've done something wrong. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Yes, sir. In your training of your team, do you have any role for recertification or is it all practical? Um, when I pulled somebody out the front, help, so, long time ago, long time ago, right, I was like, Bob, long time ago, 
I used to work for New Horizons. Oddball was working there at the time as well. I taught Microsoft classes, Citrix classes, Nobel classes, if y'all remember that term. Um, I taught all the CompTIA stuff, right? So I taught your A+, your Linux+, your Security+, plus, your Server+, plus, uh, your Network+. Plus. And when I was teaching security, you know, I taught a lot of security plus classes. When I pull somebody off the help desk, I ask them how well they are in networking, and I teach them that plus. I I will stay at night till 12, 1 o'clock in the morning sometimes when I'm teaching somebody subnet masking on the board, teaching them OSI models, teaching them networking until they can go and pass that test, and then we jump right into security plus, and I teach them that. I tell people when they work for me, I, I try to get them where they want to go. These are success stories. The people who leave me are success stories. Now, I'm not going to say everybody leaves me because it's a success story because I, I try to make sure that my team does their job. And I try to make sure that I have a really good team. And if you've got somebody, two or three people on your team that are superstars and the other people don't want to be superstars, they tend to weed themselves out, right? They tend to say, well, I'm looking at the help desk and these three guys are closing 100 tickets each a week and I'm closing 15. Yeah. I'm either going to need to step it up or find a better job. And a lot of those people tend to leave. Um, but, and that's fine, you know, I hope they go great somewhere else. This state is always hiring, I hear. And that's a lot of times where they need to be. But um, most of you may work for the state, by the way, no? 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 Okay, good. I don't want to step, don't want to step on anybody's toes um, over there. Um, but no, you create an environment where people want to work for you, where people want to learn, right? You make it fun. You know, I'm fun with my guys. Do you, get, do you help them get the certifications? Do the best I can to help them go wherever they want. I'm a strong believer in always train your replacement or you will never be promoted. I've got a guy right now that's been with me for about six years. Um, he is doing a great job. He's my architect right now. He wants to get into leadership. So I am training him the best that I can um, in leadership skills, what he needs to do to be a leader. Um, I pull him in on all my interviews, teaching the interviewing process, how to write job descriptions, how to evaluate people, and how to have that people evaluate yourself. One of the things that I've learned from managing people so long is sometimes what you feel like your employee is doing right and what your employee is doing wrong is different than what they feel like they're doing right and doing wrong. So when I do an evaluation of an employee, I turn around and I make them do an evaluation of their self. Tell me what you're good at. Tell me what you're bad at. And we sit down and we compare them. And it's, it's eye-opening for them. It's eye-opening for you. Um, and so you can really, because that never lines up. You know, there's nine different equations, you know, the box. You may think they're here, here. You think of the lawful good and the neutral, right? But they <laughs> think they're, yeah, 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 yeah. You think they're here, you know, it could be like, I think they're doing good, they think they're doing good. They think they're doing okay, I think they're doing bad. You know, there's different, you know, situations. But um, once you open those eyes, they, they, they appreciate that. They come back to me and they're like, I never looked at it that way. I never saw that that was what you were trying to get me to accomplish. Well, I tell them point blank, that's my bag. I should be more clear on what I'm trying to get you accomplished. Um, that meeting that I have with my team every week, you know, every so often, I'll, I'll jump up on my soapbox and I'll talk to them about where we're going and why we're going there. Um, and I will tell you this, and I have to do this a lot, I have to slow my team down sometimes because we're going so fast that the company can't keep up. Um, HR can't keep up with you know, so ex next thing you know, they're behind. They can't get people on boarded because they're they're trying to do something that they we we are giving them the ability to be bad because we're like they say, hey, we need a new user set up. We call them back in an hour and say we're good. So they think, well, I can wait until you know Friday afternoon at four o'clock and put in my new user. And IT's great and always work, right? So I have to slow down. I have to tell my team, look. I, have five, I give you five days. I write an audit. I send that audit to the CEO, the VP of, of HR, and the operations officer. That audit goes out every Monday. What does that audit say? That audit says five days. These are the people who have given me less than five days to set up a new user. And it names them and it tells the user. So everybody sees it. Does it work? Yeah, you start. I mean, you start. If you, if you care about your company and you care about what your company's doing and you stand on your soapbox and you preach, this is why we're doing this, nobody's going to say, ah, oh, we don't want the company to be successful. You're wrong. 
If you're, if you're walking the straight and narrow and preaching the straight and narrow, people will have to agree with you. Or they need to go work somewhere else because they don't believe in what your company's doing. So you and your team, you follow that road and nobody can say anything about it because you're doing the, the straight and narrow. Now, if you're going to start that way, I will tell you this, get yourself a good ticketing system and write everything down and audit everything. Because when people get put, when other leaders get put under stress because you're doing your job and they may not be doing theirs, they're going to fire across the back. Well, this is IT's fault. I can't do this because IT's not got me back in time. Well, if I look at this ticket, you'll see that you asked for it two hours ago and now you're going, which, why isn't it not done? You know, my SLA that I wrote for you, where we agreed on this is what you're going to get from a support standpoint from IT, says that we have 24 hours and you're telling me that you're fussing on two. What's really the problem here? You do that enough times and your CEO doesn't even blink an eye. He's just like, come on, this is your fault. This isn't IT. Get your ducks in a row. And that's, once you build that relationship with your board and your C-levels, the next thing you know, they start listening to what you have to say. Now, be aware of this too. They also start bringing you into other things. So now you're fixing operations. I got a phone call from the chief operations officer last week that says, January the 1st, we're going to revamp how we do HR and you're going to teach them how to do their job. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's a compliment. How, how, did, that that guy in how did that happen? That, is that happens because you run your department with no problems and next thing you know, you're teaching other leaders how to run their department. No is that a good deed. thing or a bad thing? No good deed goes unpunished. Right. <laughs> you do it with the security hat on, and guess what? Now I have another department who's on board with security. And I've taught them how to be on board with security. It's just changing the way we, we work with our business. That's the big thing that we're trying to do. Here. Change the way you work with your business so that you, you're not the squeaky wheel. You know, when I was working for the Fortune 15 company, I would walk into rooms where there would be a meeting and we were going to take the next six months and we're going to build this product and we're going to put this product out and it's going to change the world. And I walk into that meeting and I'll slap a piece of paper on the table and I'll say, no, RJ's dead. And I'll turn around and walk out. And they would be like, what the heck? And I'll be like, that's not PCI sound and American Express will charge us an extra three cents times transaction and let's see, we will all lose six billion dollars if we do that. And the CEO will be like, oh, no, we're, we're not going to. No, that project's dead. Thank you. Next project. So, you, you know, that's, that's not the way to run it. That's the way I had to run it, but that's not the way you sh You shouldn't use compliance to get your job done. You should use personability to get your job done. You should use what the company's doing to get your job done. Any other questions? Good questions. Nobody? Nobody. Ah, so that's my email address. If you need me, call me. Thank you all. Appreciate y'all being here. Hope you enjoy.